um, grew up in Beijing, um, extraordinarily came to the UK, I mean not the UK, came to, went to the States in 1996, and he, would, he barely spoke English at that point. Well, it's a little bit, not much. And he went to study immunology, yes. so he weren't a writer at that stage at all. I was going to be a scientist, he was going to become a scientist. <laughs> I mean, it just, it, that is just such, when I think about what an extraordinary journey she's made to writing these, these fantastically literary novels in English, I just, I, it's a, it completely boggles me. Um, a Thousand Years of Good Prayers was the um, short story collection with which she won the Guardian First Book Prize in 2006. It was followed by, uh, and it got six awards, I think. Yeah, about a count of them one for one. So six, I mean, sort of widely, widely awarded. Um, and uh, then followed by Novel of Vagrants, another short story collection, Old Boy Emerald Girl. She's been one of Bronte's 21 best young American writers, and she's one of New York's, the, the New Yorkers of 20 under 40. Don't get much more. Illustrious, like you are. You're, you're not getting older. <laughs> you're, getting older. <laughs> you're not under 40 anymore. Right? Right? So you pretty much run out of that. That's that. That's that. That's that. That's that. You can't be young forever. <laughs> Kind of in solitude, so this is your section novel, <laughs> and it tells the story of, um, it, you could say it's, it's, it has resonances with a story, a real life story that happened after Tiananmen Square. It's more recent history than a lot of your previous work. Yes, I think, you know, it, it took place in 89 and 2010, so it's quite contemporary China, and, you know, the changing of morality and value system in China, it's all in the novel. <laughs> So the real, the real life case was in 1995 when she was a young woman in China in Beijing. She was poisoned and it never got resolved. And so I, it started my thinking about the whole psychological you know, violence in the poisoning case. So I took that and I started to work on this novel more, not based on that case anymore, just to, to see why people, why the person and the poisoning in general is I mean, murder in general is very interesting. <laughs> but the murder is always a profit. But the, the poisoning is essentially a well thought of murder. You know, you, you, can, you can murder someone with a knife or with a gun, you know, out of impulse, out of passion. You cannot murder, you cannot poison someone out of passion. You have to, you know, have to access to the poisoning, you have to access to this person's, you know, intimate life. So I thought, I mean, the longer I thought about poisoning, the longer I thought, you know, poisoning was really an intimate crime in between, you know, people who lived close together. His desire to hurt her now, could it be his only way to love her? I don't hate woman, he said. But perhaps you want to kill me, she said, which is understandable too. Why would I want to kill you? That's one way to destroy me, she said. There aren't too many ways. If I were a real killer, you see, I would not be defending myself in any way. But if I were a real killer, I would seek out someone like me. Shai was not a kind person. Yes, I despised her and I pitied her. But you have to know that neither would be a sufficient reason for one to kill a person. Tell us a little bit about, more about um, how isolated and lonely they are and how they, how they, they set their lives up. You know, yes, so in a way I think uh, interesting to me is, you know, this case occurred when they were really young, when they were in their teenage years. And you know, if you look at teenagers, their life experience is very limited, but their, emo their emotions are intense and they really want to live a serious life, but this poisoning really stuck in all three of them. So two women came to America and lived a very lonely life, both divorced, but both had an unsuccessful marriage, and, and both withdrew from the world. Let's, let's leave that, part of that, and that with you, Tash. Um, so Tash, as I said, um, came to my attention in 2005, but also came to the booker's attention. I can't claim to be the only person to respond to it. Um, the first of two longest things for the Booker Prize. Um, um, he um, moved to, he was born in Taiwan, grew up in Kuala Lumpur, moved to England to study law, 
14. So you're another career changer, a high hour career changer at Cambridge. Um, and the, the Harmony Silk Factory, which was the novel in 2005, won the Whitbread First Novel Award and um, really put Malaysian literature on the map, didn't it? I mean, you and Tan Fanek have, have actually created a whole new tradition where I think one could say one didn't really exist as far as we knew. I think in a bit little. I think there, there were writers around, and, and, and certainly writers you know, who were published in Malaysia, but not, I guess, on a global level. But that, yeah, I suppose it changed. It just, I think, it opened doors in the, the powers, um, the, the sense of power in both publishing in Britain and America. Mm -hmm. And then 2009 published the map of, it, uh, map of the Invisible World, and followed by last year by Five Star Billionaire, which I have said, I have only just read it, I didn't read it when it came out, and I, I was absolutely blown away by it. I don't I think it's a, it's, the thing is absolutely, it's fascinating, partly because it captures the, a moment when you suddenly feel there is a moment when the West is no longer what most of the world is aspiring to. They're going in the opposite direction. So the, the sort of, you know, Emerald City is now, in your case, is, is Shanghai, yeah. whereas in your case it's Beijing. Yeah. So we, we may be talking about that. So will you read a bit as well? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really about five people who, who leave Malaysia to seek fame, fortune, love, um, in China. They come from different walks of life and one of them is um, a pop star who wins a talent competition. It's a huge in Malaysia now. And he wins a talent competition that takes him to Taiwan and um, he's on the brink of um, superstar. Then. So I'll, I'll introduce you. He was the youngest contestant and shining with the innocence of a boy recently arrived in the countryside. His hair was spiky and dyed with flame coloured streaks which he had done himself. Recently, he saw a video of his performance on YouTube and couldn't believe how bad he looked. <laughs> After the first song, the judges said he, that he had the voice of an angel. But even before that, from the moment he opened his mouth to sing the very first note, he knew he was going to win. He heard the strange, pure sound of his voice amplified by the microphone in the vast auditorium. Its echo was separated by a split second from the time he felt it in his throat. He recognized that the voice was his, but he felt distance from it too. It sounded as if it no longer belonged to him. In the audience, young girls were waving multicolored fluorescent buttons that glowed in the dark. When he sang the love ballad in Mandarin, everyone screamed as he hit the high notes in the chorus. He felt the noise they made reverberating in his chest and rhythm, and he knew in that instant that his life was was going to become confused and messy, full of privileges and sorrows he hadn't asked for. <laughs> so let's talk about your characters. You have four characters and a fifth character. There's slightly different, four object, object characters yeah. in a way, one of whom is Gary, who we've heard about. Uh, talk a little bit about the other two, two men. There's, two yes, there's um, Gary, who is a pop star. He comes from a small town um, in the north of Malaysia, in from Kelantan, which is my, uh, where my father comes from. As does uh, Phoebe, who is a young uh, woman who leaves school early. Uh, she works in all sorts of slightly dodgy jobs. She gets an offer to, to work in, in, a, in, a, in a fantastic new job in China, but when she arrives in China, like so many people, she finds out that the job isn't for real. And she's then forced to make ends meet and eventually just sets her sights really high. and. Uh, goes to Shanghai and reinvents herself with the help of these self-help books. And she wants to become like some of the characters in your novel, you know, very glamorous young women in search of a sugar daddy, because basically that, you know, there's a whole set of dreadful Yes. <laughs> um, and then you have, I have to pronounce it, Yinghui. Yinghui. Who's a businesswoman successful. Yeah, we meet her, we see her in Shanghai, she's a successful businesswoman, but she has also reinvented herself. Following some dreadful thing that's happened to her, suddenly an emotional tragedy. Um, she was a, a, a left-leaning, poetry-loving sort of hippie uh, in Malaysia before. And her experience of migration to Shanghai is very different because she is educated in the middle class, whereas Phoebe and Gary are not. They're just they're totally working class and, and Chinese educated, whereas Yingui is um, you know English educated and a bit like Justin, who's the fourth. Maybe the fourth character 
who comes from a very wealthy family of property developers and is sent to Shanghai to buy the company firm, to develop the, the company interests there. Every, like everyone else, they are interested, they, they are obsessed by breaking into China. Everyone wants a piece of the China market. So he's sent forth. Um, and actually, his moment of liberation comes from um, actually having a breakdown. Two of them have breakdowns. Yeah, not actually quite a few. <laughs> 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 at, some point, at some point in the novel, they have breakdowns. They have a breakdown in order to find I think there's some, I think two of them have a breakdown in, in China. I think there is a sense in which China is a really tough place. I think so many people go. And there's this fifth character, Walter, who is very mysterious, really, isn't he? He's the, he, he becomes his writing himself out of it. Yeah, so he's the, we, we don't know, he's another one of these sort of self made villains. I mean, he has this extra, extraordinary image, but, but which we know is sort of, we feel, we sense that it's, sort of, it's very fragile, and that deep down he too is incredibly lonely. Um, he is connected to all of them, and then as we go through the novel, their paths cross in Shanghai, and also we, we learn how to have crossed in relation before that. So although in, in, one, in one sense it is a novel about contemporary China, it's really what anchors the novel is, is Malaysia. It's about how um, as hard as they try to escape whatever they had in Malaysia or not had in Malaysia, that's always where they draw back to and that's what really informs the rest of their lives. Mm. And you have this sort of um, strange glancing encounters. So Phoebe has a portrait of Gary <coughs> on her wall. And then after he's had his breakdown, she talks to him in internet chat rooms and doesn't know who he is. They don't really know who each other are. No, quite, quite often they don't connect. They all, they're all seeking some sort of deep, intimate connection. And intimacy, I think, if you live in a big city, it, especially in a city like Shanghai, which is a city of 20 million, it's what everyone wants. Everyone I met in Shanghai wanted intimacy. It's a bit like London. Um, except Shanghai is twice as big as London, and twice as difficult, therefore, to, to, to achieve that intimacy. Can I just pick you up on that, that thing about intimacy? Because there's one thing that I was really struck by in both of the novels was this other thing about people living in incredibly close quarters. So, so, so Phoebe lives with, is it Yan Yan? What's her name? Yeah, yeah. Yan Yan. In a one room flat where they more or less take to sleep in shifts. Mm. And your character says a, a, a dying man behind a curtain and the whole family living in this tiny place with. No, it, yes. The... Well, that's one. That's one thing we know about China is the population. As you know, said, the numbers are just huge, and space is limited. So I always say, you know, in China, you don't have private lives. All you can have are you know secret lives, because you, you have to live next. To, you know, everybody lives next to someone, but you can, but you can still make a secret space in your head, which is all these characters do, even when they're in China. So there's something about intimacy which is not is different to proximity, which, which I think is, is very very strong in both these novels. I was wondering whether there was a difference, or what you saw as a difference between Shanghai and Beijing, whether you, you know whether there is a qualitative difference. Well, Shanghai is probably closer to the West, I would say, than Beijing. Beijing still retains part of the old capital. And so, if you speak to sort of foreigners or expats who live in. The ones who live in Beijing tend to be more attached to, to Beijing than the ones in Shanghai tend to be to Shanghai because they had to overcome greater hurdles in order to integrate into, into Beijing. Some. So I've had a fake handbag to sum up that for me. They sort of totemic roles, you know? I mean, no, absolutely. I mean, that's quite, it's slightly flippantly yeah, in the couple of interviews when people have said, can you summarize what the novel's about? Like, I said it's essentially about love, migration, and handbags. But it's, <laughs> yeah. that's not. Far from the truth, because you, you know what I mean. Yes. When, you're in, when you're in China, there's this like, particular amount of certain kind of you know, striver, you know, the striver, the, the inspiring young woman. I love this one little episode I saw in the movie. It's about after about someone having a sugar daddy, and she complained about. She said, "Well, all I get is handbag. <laughs> you know, for birthday, for Christmas, for New Year's Day, and for you know Children's Day, for Women's Day, all these handbags. <laughs> and that's that's a step." <laughs>